Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Rick Murphy. I'm the Community and Economic Development Director for Golden, and we are here to discuss the Coors Tech proposal and their future plans for their 12 acre site, which is on the north side of downtown. I think before we really dig in, I want to do a quick round of introductions. We'll, we'll do both uh, staff as well as the applicant team. Um, Stephanie, uh, our, our Joe Poor and John Houseman in the meeting yet? Um, I do not see them. They should be panelists, so when they come in, they'll be on screen. Okay. I just received a message that Dan Cohen is not yet able to join as panelist. So maybe there's some issues on joining the panel at the moment. All right. All right. I will look in the attendee list and see if I see any of them. Um, okay, I see Joe, let me grab him. Okay, and there's Dan. And John Houseman is here as well. So if all of the panelists could turn on their cameras, uh, their video, we, uh, we want to do a quick round of introductions. Uh, let's start with staff. Uh, Janet, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Hi, my name is Janet McCubbin. I am the Affordable Housing Policy Coordinator for the City of Golden. Great, and Joe? Hi, I'm uh, Joe Poor. I'm the City Engineer. Okay, and John. John Houseman. Uh, John Houseman with Muller Engineering. I am the city's on-call traffic engineer. Great, and I think that covers uh, city staff. Dan, are you able to? Are you having Are you having some of my audio problems? Okay, uh, John. Um, how about? Uh, John McIntyre, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and uh, and maybe uh, facilitating the introductions of your team. Yeah, I'm, uh, I think my audio is working. Can you hear me okay at that end? Yes. Perfect. John McIntyre, I'm a uh, principal with Tribe Architects. I'm hoping that Dan Cohen, who's uh, trying to get his audio working at the moment too, will go around maybe the balance of the team. Um, Curtis, do you want to maybe go next as we wait for Dan to get on board? Yes, sure. Um, I'm Curtis Rowe with Kimley Horn. I'm a traffic engineer and we prepared the traffic impact study for this project. Um, maybe Kim, are you on? Hi, yep, I'm Kim Mangle and I have been working with Coors Tech on community engagement. Excellent. Uh, Josh? Oh, hi everybody. My name is Josh Radoff. I'm the sustainability consultant for the team. Who's, who am I missing here before we hit Dan? Jeremiah Simpson with Kimley Horn. I'm the uh, parking and mobility specialist for the team. Thanks, Jeremiah. And I think we might just be waiting for Dan beyond that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to help Dan with some audio. audio issues. Dan, if you can go to the top at audio and video and switch audio, you can at least try to call in for now. Or go to speaker and microphone settings and you should be able to test your microphone there and change um, some settings to see if it'll let you work. Okay, well, maybe while Dan is getting his uh, audio connected, we can we can start. There's a, a staff portion of this presentation first, and then we'll come back to Dan in a little bit here. So let me go ahead and share. Uh, the presentation from staff. Um, so just to go over the agenda real briefly, we've we've already covered the introductions minus Dan. Uh, and what we'll also discuss is the meeting information, upcoming meetings, uh, and some of the logistics of, of meetings that are that are coming, as well as this current meeting. 
Uh, we will have a brief city staff overview of the project as it stands now and the timeline of events that led us up to this date. Uh, and then the applicant will have a chance to present uh, their proposal. And then we'll have a question and answer session by topic. And uh, as, as many of you on the call know, the official development plan has a number of topics. So we want to take those one by one and, uh, and have an opportunity for people to ask questions about each, each aspect of what is being proposed. So tonight is March 10th. It's uh, 5 p.m. and that's the the meeting at the top of the page here. And so this is the first of a series of meetings uh, related to uh, the proposal that are that are intended to reach out to the community and get community input as well as uh, provide more community education on what is being proposed. I know there is a lot uh, to digest within that official development plan. So we're going to attempt to cover those in this meeting and the, and the meetings that come uh, throughout the month. So after this meeting, we will have a meeting next week on March 16th uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. That one will be an in-person meeting in council chambers and there will be a short presentation and then we'll have uh, stations set up around the room so that you can uh, by topic so that, that people can address uh, specific topic areas of interest such as sustainability or the workforce housing proposal etc. Um, and staff will be there as well to answer questions about city code as well as the policy uh, uh, associated with some of these proposals uh, from the city perspective. And then we'll have a series of office hour meetings. Uh, those are March 15th, 17th and 21st. And you can see the times that are listed here for each of those. Those are in-person meetings as well. Uh, they'll be at the planning office at 1445 10th Street. And the purpose of these meetings is to allow people to drop in and have more in-depth one-on-one conversations with, uh, with either city staff or uh, with the applicant and uh, to get some more information on their uh, proposal. So those are three other meetings that are coming up. And then April 6th is the continued planning commission meeting uh, and, the, and the hearing date. So uh, after planning commission completes its hearing process, uh, their recommendation will go to city council and they'll have their own hearing process. Uh, so those are the meetings to come. As far as the, the, the meeting format, uh, this particular meeting is being broadcast and it will be recorded and posted on guidinggolden.com. Uh, the it's important to understand the difference between the role of the applicant and the role of staff. Uh, the role of the applicant is to make their proposal um, and share that with the community and, and planning commission and council. And staff is here to represent the city code as well as the community at large in the form of our city policy documents, which, uh, which, which have a basis in a lot of community input over the years, including things like the transportation master plan, the comprehensive plan, neighborhood plans and the like. So uh, that is the role of staff to educate the community on the city's perspective uh, and advise planning commission and council. Uh, following the, um, uh, the, the course tech presentation, we'll have a Q and A session. You'll be able to ask a number of questions by topic, as I mentioned previously. Uh, when we go through that section, and we'll remind you of this uh, when we get to that point, uh, we'll, we'll want to use the chat function to alert the panelists that were just introduced that you have a question. And we want to be able to offer you the opportunity to either ask your question within the chat itself in writing, and then we can read it out and have, have the appropriate person answer that question, or we can bring you into the meeting and you can ask your question yourself. So. We'll just ask you what you want to do or, or just tell us what you would prefer when you ask your question and we will we will get to those questions uh, at that uh, Q&A session. Uh, and this is important to remember uh, this meeting is is, a, is sort of a free form conversation. Uh, these these comments will not be transcribed and, and sent to planning commission and council. So it's important to send all of your comments to this email address planning commission at cityofgolden.net. And in that way, we can ensure that they're received and that they're part of the record. As I mentioned, we'll be going uh, through the Q&A on a topic by topic basis. These are the main topics.
topics that are found in the uh, official development plan that the applicant is proposing. And so that's how we'll structure the questions. Uh, we want to make sure we have a chance to cover each of these topics before we open it up to a, uh, a sort of general questions. Okay, so digging into uh, the, the current zoning and the site itself. So the zoning right now is, is illustrated on the right. It's outlined, the site itself is outlined in blue and the zoning is indicated by color. So M2 is this brown kind of color and that is industrial zoning. That, uh, that zoning as it currently sits uh, allows all kinds of industrial uses, including the manufacturing use that went on at Course Tech for 100 plus years. So it, it's, it's really geared towards uh, heavy industrial. Um, however, it does allow general commercial uses as well, um, including the uses that are allowed in C2 and C1. So C2 is and C1 are, are zoning de designations that allow things like retail, and restaurants, and office space, and mixed use in the form of all of those commercial uses with, with residential as well. Uh, so when you think of C2 and C1, think of what you see downtown today and the uses that are there currently. Um, the uh, current zoning would allow much of what Coors Tech is proposing in their official development plan. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later um, so they do have much of what they need already in the current zoning. However, the applicant is proposing to go beyond current code requirements in some cases and address uh, some of the policy goals in the community that are found in the neighborhood plans uh, and in the comprehensive plan and transportation master plan. So they, are, they, are, uh, they have been studying those, those policy documents and much of what they propose is uh, related to those those aspirational um, desires that are found in our policy documents that are not necessarily required by code. So that's that's one thing. And in exchange, the applicant is asking for flexibility. And that is, that is really where um, a lot of the differences are between where, uh, where, the, where, this, where the applicant is now and where staff is advising planning commission. So it's not the, the vision itself, it's more in the details of how that vision would be expressed uh, when that's implemented over time. So they are they are proposing a more flexible um, approach to these uh, to these offers uh, and a district wide approach. And uh, as I, th I think, as you listen to the applicant's presentation and you read the official development plan, I think it would be a good idea to ask yourself, is this a good deal compared with the current zoning, this M2, C2, C1 arrangement, and what's allowed there? Um, and if the answer is no, or, or maybe not quite, um, I think the question then is, what can the applicant do to change the proposal to make it a better outcome for the community? So if you, it, it involves digging into some of these specifics here, which I, which I know is, is a little difficult because that official development plan is, is very technical and detailed. Um, staff has provided uh, documents within the Planning Commission packet, as well as a sort of quick guide on Guiding Golden to, to help you understand what those, um, what, what those differences are and, and some of the details of the proposal. But uh, we're always here for, for any more uh, specific questions, including tonight. Um, so, It'll be good for Coors Tech to hear your comments tonight, to hear your questions, and the, and the input you provide through planning commission at cityofgolden.net will be good for planning commission and city council to hear as well. So this is that same area that I, that I just showed you, only this shows the whole area colored purple, and that, in, that is an indication that what, they, what the applicant is proposing, what Coors Tech wants to do here is rezone the property to planned unit development uh, from its current zoning. And that would be a site-wide planned unit development designation. And what accompanies a planned unit development in this case is called an official development plan, which I know I've referred to earlier. And the official development plan is, is really the, the details of the zoning. That becomes the zoning for the property. So that's why that document is so important. And it's what uh, planning commission is 
is pouring over in their uh, analysis and, and in their hearing process. Um, as part of that uh, request, in addition to the planned unit development and, and ODP request, the, the applicant is also requesting an alley vacation. So believe it or not, there is actually an alley where this dashed green line is through the parking lot. Uh, it doesn't look like an alley, and I don't know if it ever did look like an alley, but it was platted as an alley. And so in order for the applicant to have the flexibility to use this portion of the site in a more effective way, they are, they are asking for a vacation of that alley section here. And I'm sure they'll touch on that as well in, in their presentation. One of the planning documents I referred to earlier in our, in our set of policies is the North Clear Creek Neighborhood Plan, and that was implemented in 2017. Uh, there was a significant outreach process at that time, and the plan covered the area north of Clear Creek, as the name would indicate, uh, everything from, uh, from Goose Town on the east, all the way down to where the community center is on the west. So that, that sort of belt across the middle of Golden, just north of the creek. The area that encompasses Coors Tech was considered an area of significant change in this in this plan. Uh, the thought was that some Coors Tech would have uh, would would either leave the site or reimagine the site, and the idea was to to get input from the community at that time uh, to to determine what the community would like to see there in the future. Uh, and so with that outreach process, there, there's a page in the, in the neighborhood plan just about Coors Tech, uh, but it indicated that this, this area in the future, if, if manufacturing goes away, it should be a mixed use area. It should have a pedestrian friendly environment. It should have uh, housing for a range of incomes along with retail and, and restaurants and, and, uh, and, and, and a sort of a vibrant extension of downtown is, is, is the type of feedback that we heard as staff and planning commission. Uh, so that, that, is, that is the vision that, uh, uh, that, that the applicant studied at uh, staff's encouragement and we, we talked through quite a bit before they actually submitted their application. Uh, just a quick timeline here. So uh, staff has really been talking to, uh, to the applicants uh, for, for a while now, since 2021 and I would characterize the first phase of those discussions as talking about what the current zoning allows, um, informing the applicant about the zoning code rewrite process, which was really just getting underway at that point, as far as first draft goes. Uh, we, we talked about the, the uses proposed in the, in, the, in the draft zoning code, as well as the current uses that are there, and gave them a, a full understanding of, of that background on zoning. Uh, then the conversation uh, really turned towards the, the community vision, uh, Golden Vision 2030, the comprehensive plan, the neighborhood plan I just, I just mentioned, and our uh, recent transportation master plan. So they, uh, they, were, they were studying those, those plans uh, in, in detail and asking staff questions about them. And uh, we went over that in, in, in quite a bit of detail during that period. And they also discussed uh, their, their, um, their thoughts and questions with uh, different departments in the city, including sustainability, uh, historic preservation staff, our engineering staff, economic development, uh, and the fire department. So they get, gave them a, a background in, in uh, all things city related. In July, uh, maybe, maybe some of you went to the neighborhood meeting that was held at the Coors Tech campus uh, in July, and we had a good turnout for that meeting, uh, over 100 people there. And at that point, the, the applicant was, was able to share their vision for the site with the community and take questions. Uh, so that was really the first big uh, you know, conversation with the community uh, in that neighborhood meeting format. And at that point, there were no specifics known it was really more of a vision and uh, discussion about future plans in general. Uh, around that same time, Course Tech, uh, the encouragement of, of city staff met with a number of boards and commissions in the community, as well as civic groups, uh, such as uh, Rotary, Lions, uh, Golden United, and others. Uh, 
uh, they probably have a list to share with you with you later. Uh, in August of 2021, that was when they made their initial submission of their PUD to the city uh, for review. Uh, they submitted a, a number of documents uh, that were distributed throughout city departments for review and comments. And that actually went through four more rounds of review and, and comments before uh, it was ready to uh, to submit to planning commission. And as as many of you know, uh, the first planning commission meeting was February 2nd, uh, when that first the first part of the hearing was was held. And then that meeting, uh, after about a four hour discussion, was continued to February 23rd. Uh, the meeting on February 23rd was rather short because the applicant asked for another continuance to April 6th. And as I mentioned earlier, the April 6th is the next meeting with Planning Commission. Uh, the reason for the applicant's request was that there were a number of members of the community who wanted more time to take a look at this official development plan, to be able to uh, ask the applicant questions, to be able to ask staff questions as well. And so that's that's what we're here doing tonight and uh, through much of the month of March. And I believe that is uh, my portion of the, uh, the presentation, at least the beginning here. And so I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to see if uh, Dan Cohen uh, is audible now and he can introduce himself and uh, and speak to this from the applicant perspective. Oh, we don't seem to have audio. Okay. I'm okay, I am going to unmute his phone then. Give me one second. Dan, I don't see your call in user anymore. Can she um, yeah. Can you talk again? Yeah. I can sort of hear you on, oh, on your computer. Okay. Dan, I think we can hear you now. Can you hear can me? You hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe turn off your computer audio though, because it's it's getting feedback or echo. Okay. All right. You can hear me now. Correct. Great. Right. Okay. We're getting some feedback. So. Okay. Can Rick? Can you still hear me? Okay. Thank you, Rick. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. I really appreciate that uh, so many people have uh, gathered this evening and uh, the city for organizing this and for Rick's um, setting the table. Um, I'm Dan Cohen, and I'm leading the Coors Tech 9th Street Redevelopment Project on behalf of the Coors family and Coors Tech. And tonight we're going to have a we're going to give you a, a high level overview of the project and, and why we're requesting a rezoning. And then we'll delve a, a bit into detail into each of the key elements of the project, including sustainability, open space, mobility, parking, et cetera. We intentionally won't get too detailed in our initial presentation so that we can use most of the evening to hear your comments and, and field your questions to make sure we spend a uh, majority of the evening on the issues you're most interested in. John, can you please... Um, Put up the presentation. Yeah, Stephanie, I think you may just need to uh, allow me to share our presentation. All right, you should have presenter abilities. I do. Thanks so much. And hopefully you all are seeing that now. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for being so helpful and for John for getting us up. Next slide, please. So let me start with a brief explanation of who Coors Tech is. It's kind of funny how everyone in town 
knows about Coors Tech, certainly knows where this property is at 9th and Washington, um, but very few people actually know much about Coors Tech. So I won't spend too much time, but it's a company founded on this property that we're talking about tonight in, in 1910. The company is known globally for its innovations in industrial ceramics and the kiln technology essential for producing those um, ceramic products. The company actually has many facilities in Golden, a number of which are uh, off of uh, McIntyre Street. Um, but its headquarters are currently in a shared um, lease building located just outside Golden. This redevelopment project that we're talking about tonight represents our intentions for the next chapter for our 9th Street property and the company's return to Golden. Coors Tech and the Coors family, Coors family's broader business interests are now led by the fifth generation of Coors family members in gold. It's those family members who are spearheading the redevelopment and who will ultimately come to work each day on the site. Coors Tech and Golden have grown up together, and so it seemed obvious to us to bring Coors Tech back home by building its new global headquarters here. Next slide, please. So again, I, I know everyone's generally familiar of um, what we're talking about, um, but in, in just a second, um, we're gonna, I, I wanna spend a, a minute making sure that we're all on the same page about the property that we're referring to. Okay, next slide, please. Next. So the property, um, just for some quick context that we're talking about, is approximately 12 and a half acres. It's bounded by uh, Washington Avenue on the west and Ford Street on the east, 7th Street on the north, and um, 10th Street on the south. Uh, obviously, the southernmost block, that surface parking lot on 10th Street, uh, is bounded by uh, Jackson Street on the west. So the site does not include, of course, the former Golden High School, now the American Mountain. There are 22 buildings on the site with nearly 500,000 square feet in them. The site is almost entirely fenced and closed to the public except for a surface parking lot at Ford and 10th Street. Coors Tech allows the public to use about 160 parking spaces in that lot for free to visit downtown and its businesses. So many of you may have parked there once before. The site also has almost no greenery and no public open space. So um, while many of the operations there have wound out in recent months, it still is an active manufacturing facility. Um, although, as I mentioned, a number of the buildings have been vacated. And in the next coming weeks, actually, um, there'll start to be some of the buildings will be uh, cleaned up and cleared of uh, unhealthy building materials. Next slide, please. So what's our vision for the site? Underlying all the discussions about zoning, city process, and PUD requirements is our excitement for a completely new vision for this property that we've put extraordinary time and effort to create. In fact, many of you um, who are attending tonight, um, we've met with and probably have given us input that has helped shape our vision. Thank you for that. Simply put, the vision is for a transformation from a closed off manufacturing facility into a beautifully designed, vibrant mixed-use district with offices, housing, restaurants, and a hotel. It extends and enhances downtown and becomes an integral part of the community. To achieve this, our plan includes a significant amount of open space, a comprehensive collection of design and operational commitments that should make this the most sustainable mixed-use project in the state. New public access through the site for people, bikes, and cars, and a significant amount of new parking for use by tenants and the public, as well as multiple preserved and adaptively reused old buildings and another, a number of other elements we're going to talk about. So this vision is most achievable with a rezoning that would reduce the amount of space that could be built on the site, actually, but dramatically increase the quality of what's created here. John's going to speak to this as well, but I, I just want to make sure it's clear to everyone off the top. We are not seeking a rezoning to get a, 
the ability to build more stuff. Actually, if this rezoning is approved, we will uh, lose the ability to build certain uses, and we will in total be able to build less square footage. But we're confident it will be much better. So now I'm going to hand off to John McIntyre, who introduced himself briefly. He's a, a senior architect and principal with Triba Architects, and there are uh, master plan designers for the district. And he's going to share more details about the vision and, and how it can be achieved. Thanks, Dan. Can everybody uh, hear me okay? Perfect. And uh, th thanks again for having us for having us here. Um, you know, really to assist in understanding the qualitative impacts of the PUD framework um, and to illustrate our proposed vision a little further, we've prepared, prepared a number of illustrative perspectives that just begin to explore how the standards and guidelines of the PUD will inform buildings on the site. Um, we want to reiterate that we're only at a master plan level. So these images don't reflect the final architectural design, but they do give a sense of how the scale grain and character of the site might evolve in response to the content of the PUD. We think that's important for the public to try and understand. So this first illustration is from the west side of Washington Avenue, looking east to the site. It's no doubt familiar uh, in terms of a view. You can see two of the existing shed form buildings on the site and the current pretty tough condition of the sidewalk and the public realm. What you're seeing is a kind of a transition into a new proposal. And in the sketch illustration, you can see a variety of facade conditions and building forms with differing upper story setback conditions over a three story street edge. Sidewalk edges are really activated by retail and landscape with a new enhanced amenity zone against the street and a new lane connects uh, Washington Avenue into the site providing public, sp uh, public access into the open space network. Um, lower and upper stories are really differentiated and materials are lightening up the building to enhance the setback conditions and reduce the impact of the upper floors. In this second view, you're looking north from the corner of 9th and Washington towards the site. And really in this view, you can see again those similar building forms. Um, and you can see uh, the impact of the uh, a series of building new building forms stepping up uh, Washington Ave, really lining that street corridor and stepping up the, the uh, hill to the north. Here you can see the impact of those standards and guidelines in shaping upper level setbacks ensuring articulation and variation in the street edge condition. Again, there's variety in building forms, you know, really active and transparent ground floor facades against the street edges and an enhanced sidewalk condition with street trees and planting. Materials are mainly masonry with smaller areas of glass facades distributed within. We wanted to give that sort of close up context before we duck out a little bit more and talk about the district approach to a PUD more specifically. As Rick outlined, we're seeking approval of a planned unit development or a PUD for the project. We know that PUDs are not that common within Golden and neither is this type of large scale master planned development, uh, particularly in this proximity to the downtown. Um, this makes uh, this type of format for discussion and feedback from the public really critical to the process. What this PUD really enables us to do is to develop a district-wide approach for the project and provide more specific control over development outcomes on the site. This is a legacy project for the Coors family and it will provide a new home for Coors Tech um, and other companies, tenants and residents that share in their vision and values. Uh, there's a series of guiding principles that drive this development and it will be a place that is really welcoming, publicly accessible and of golden. I think importantly the standards and guidelines outlined in the PUD document are really intended to enshrine the series of commitments to the city and to the public. Um, it's very important for us that you know, as Dan noted, that this is not about doing more on the site, but it's all about doing things better. And what the rezone allows us to do is approach really critical aspects of the site master planning, such as design quality, open space, parking, sustainability, art, historic preservation on this district wide basis, rather than on a single site one at a time. So why is this uh, approach, this district approach so important? I think critically approaching the district holistically rather than as separate pieces allows us to deliver better and more integrated results. 
Um, it also allows us to provide more res specific responses to the site context. Uh, its topography, connections into the adjacent neighborhoods, the adjacent highway and road network, and the existing historic structures on the site. It also allows us to address items not required or possible under the current code, such as enhanced requirements for open space, and ensuring that that open space is actually at ground level and publicly accessible, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it's really important to note that taking a district-wide approach to the design and planning of large sites is not a new idea. It reflects national and international best practice for projects in cities, towns, and rural settings that are really aiming to deliver high-quality places that are well integrated within their immediate context and reflect local co character and values um, and are more socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable. Let's just run through some of the specific benefits of this approach as it relates to cause tech. We're committing to consistent standards across all phases of redevelopment. We'll talk a little bit about that more. We're really creating a master plan level document that's going to guide future development on the site. It obviously governs building heights, land uses, setbacks, open space, sustainability, and it's going to codify standards around parking and mobility, workforce, housing, district art, historic preservation and design. A lot of this is also about the preservation of uh, the predominant historic de historic character defining features of the district, elements on the site, existing buildings and um, equipment as well. And there's a real desire to ensure permanent accessibility through the site, which Dan will talk to a little bit more soon. Additional benefits of the rezoning is that it significantly narrows the allowed land uses that are currently available within the M1 zoning in particular, uh, although part of the site is in C2 and C1 districts as well. It's going to eliminate industrial uses um, and those that are vehicle dependent, like drive through facilities. And the new allowable land uses in the M1 zoning are much, are much more consistent uh, with the C1 and C2 zones. It's also going to ensure redevelopment will be compatible with the downtown context. And we talk a lot about um, the idea of being complementary to, but distinctive from the historic Main Street condition of downtown Golden. This is a slightly different historic pattern of development on the site and one that's reflected within the building form standards we've developed. And it's going to really promote the goals of the comprehensive plan and the transportation master plan. It's important to note that the development will not occur all at once. And the structure of the PUD reflects this need for a consistent control over development that is going to be undertaken in multiple phases. It's likely that the full development of the site will occur over a period of maybe 10 to 15 years. So we're not talking about everything happening now. We're talking about uh, phase development over time. We wanted to dive a little bit more into uh, the benefits of this district approach. It's in the big picture, you know, it's really important to reiterate this idea of doing better and not more. And as Dan noted, there is significantly more development density available under the current zoning than would be available under the proposed PUD. In fact, it's actually very likely that the site might be more valuable to a typical developer under the existing zoning than under the PUD, which comes with a reduction in area and significant additional oversight restrictions and commitments. Ultimately, this rezone will allow us to deliver better and more integrated design and placemaking with more specific control over outcomes, clear public benefits, and more limitations on development density. This is a pretty special and unique opportunity, and our intent here is to really create an exemplary place that reflects the cause family legacy and is fully integrated with and complementary to downtown Golden. The quantity, quality, and character of open space provided across the district is a fundamental driver for both the placemaking and environmental performance of the place and really directly reflects the guiding principles uh, on the site and driving design and development. Critically, we're really proud to commit to providing on-site on open space equivalent to 40% of the site area and to augmenting current zoning requirements to ensure a large proportion of that space is both at ground level and publicly accessible. So this amount significantly exceeds the City of Golden requirements, which currently don't require any open space on the site and will soon require 15% after the pending uh, City Code updates. This 50% of the provided 
Um, additionally, our plan is committing that 50% of the provided open space will be at ground level and 25% of the open space will be fully publicly accessible. To give you a bit of a sense of a scale for that, that means that on the property we're committing to more than two acres of land as ground level open space. That's slightly more than the size of Parfit Park to the south. Um, and we're committing to just over one acre of land as fully publicly accessible open space within the bog. That's slightly more than the size of Vanover Park uh, to the east. In addition to opening up new streets, obviously, at 8th and 9th Street to provide connections across and providing pedestrian connectivity on Jackson Street in the north-south direction linking 10th to 7th. So this combination of a new street network, a connective street network, and this provision of open space for the site is, uh, is, is really critical to the plan. Regarding historic preservation, we're committed to the adaptive reuse and preservation of multiple historic buildings on the site, and specifically to the retention of historic building one on Ford Street. The unique character of existing brick, timber, concrete and steel buildings will really provide the DNA for future plans and reflect clearly the legacy of Causetech's history on the site. We have committed to a comprehensive historic and technical assessment of the fabric of the site to inform these plans and really ensure that the buildings are repaired and enhanced, hopefully guaranteeing their vibrancy and relevance for another 100 years into the future. I'm going to hand it back to Dan, who's going to talk through some more of the principles of the plan. Thanks, John. Next slide, please. So I'm going to move kind of quickly here um, through a number of slides that are important information, but again, we want to reserve as much time as possible for everybody's comments and questions. So uh, John uh, made mention of new open space. He made mention of new streets cutting through the site and accessibility north-south. Um, these are um, some of the key components to making sure the site becomes uh, much more ac uh, accessible and inclusive. Um, the art uh, that would be provided um, and funded by Coors Tech here will be provided and designed by artists from diverse perspectives. That also um, makes the place more inclusive and representative of a variety of viewpoints, telling stories from um, a variety of perspectives. Um, the project will result in the creation of many new jobs at a variety of income levels. Um, we'll talk in a little bit more depth in a minute about a commitment to build and or fund 10% of all housing as deed restricted workforce housing. Um, also, I'll get a, a little more in depth about mobility and I'll focus on multimodal, a variety of modes. People can have choices in how they move around, move around and also a lot of additional parking. Yep. Uh, let's talk about sustainability. Our commitment to environmental sustainability is significant. And our goal is to set a new standard for environmental sustainability for private sector projects of this type. So just to tick off specifically what our goals are, it's to uh, substantially meet, well, really exceed city and industry standards um, to make the entire district net zero energy, to contribute um, land that we've already talked about for permanently accessible, publicly accessible and, and, um, and privately accessible open space that's part of the community. Um, to make sure that all the buildings on the site are super energy efficient and um, to make sure that we bring a greater emphasis than ever before really, uh, not on just a, a sustainability, but as I was speaking to accessibility and mobility. Um, those things all play into how you make a place sustainable. Next slide, please. So what are the, uh, what are the requirements or commitments within the PUD? To this end, first of all, um, we commit to having the site be certified uh, by a LEED Neighborhood Development Program. So a lot of people have heard of LEED certification for buildings. They also have a program for uh, overall land development sites. We're going to do both. We'll get LEED certified for the overall site and a minimum of LEED gold for all new buildings on the site. There's a lot more content here that we can get into based on questions, but just quickly to tick off, um, we're committing to a green infrastructure plan, a management plan, to certifying uh, the buildings all as um, uh, in the health and wellness category, 
from one of two programs, fit well or well building. Um, on the transition to a carbon-free um, economy and environment, we're committing to uh, all new buildings be all electric. So um, gas, natural gas is a major contributor to um, climate change and greenhouse gases. So that's a, a big part of, of the improvement that we can make. Um, we're, as I mentioned, target net zero energy for the entire site. And we'll talk, we can talk more later about why it says target instead of guarantee. Um, we're exploring district-wide energy systems, including geothermal and heat recovery, to see if they're feasible to the site. And I, lastly, I want to make it clear, what we're committing to is being subject to existing and any future city code requirements with regard to sustainability. We're not looking for any leniency under whatever the city requires today or in the future. But not but, and we're committing to a number of additional things, some of which I already mentioned. So we're gonna do whatever the city code is, however it changes, and a whole bunch of other things. Next slide, please. Uh, mobility, um, our plan supports and aligns with Golden's Transportation Master Plan. And as Rick mentioned in the outset, we spent a good amount of time on our own and with staff making sure we understood what the goals were there. Uh, a big part of that is working to uh, decrease the number of cars that come with one person in them. Those are called single occupancy vehicle trips. So we know people will still drive and we'll have parking for them. And we'll also have a lot of incentives uh, to encourage people to find ways to either not come to, to work every day of the week um, and work remotely as it's become quite common or to get to work um, other ways sharing um, a ride with somebody else, using a bike, taking public transit, all of these things. It's good for the environment, it's good for traffic, and it's good for placemaking. So this concept that is called TDM, Transportation Demand Management, um, I know it's kind of a nerdy thing. It really is a common best practice across Colorado in many front range cities and really nationally. Um, next slide, please. A related topic or a component of that is shared parking. Shared parking is a unique concept when you're talking about mixed use projects. When you're talking about one building with one use, it doesn't apply. When you're talking about multiple buildings with a variety of uses, simply put, it means the same parking space can be shared by a variety of users doing a variety of things. So for example, I might drive to work, park in a parking space, and in the evening, go home, and that parking space is used by someone coming to uh, a restaurant, obviously. That's the concept of shared parking. It means we provide the right amount of parking um, and make sure that there's always enough uh, for everybody who's using the project. And it also means that on nights and weekends, when uh, there aren't office workers on the site, there will be a, a ton of new additional parking available to the public. Uh, and, and as last noted here, um, no parking will be allowed for the site in any residential uh, uh, neighborhood or any site zoned residential. Next slide, next uh, slide, please. So just quickly on art, we think art is a really important part of how you make a place feel uniquely of its context and how we make this place feel um, like it really is uniquely part of Golden. And so we've committed uh, at a minimum $750,000 to fund art that would be throughout the district and publicly viewable. Um, at a minimum $750,000. On the high end, it could be the, a bigger number that's equivalent to 2% of the cost of the first building. And art could take a variety of forms. You can see in the pictures here. It could be um, fountains and sculptures and murals. And we want to hire um, a, a variety of artists locally and otherwise to make sure that we achieve this in a, in a beautiful way. Next, please. So I think um, everybody's probably well-versed in the housing crunch in our state in the front range and then more specifically in Golden. There's some statistics there that reinforce that. Um, the Coors family felt from day one 
with their vision for the site that workforce housing was an important component. They've been a long time significant employer in this community, and so they've seen firsthand uh, how important it is to have accessible and affordable housing. And so the commitment is for um, ensuring that uh, a high quality workforce, like teachers and firefighters and other folks, and, and a diverse population can afford to live in this community. Next, please. The requirements that go along with that, for every nine units of housing we build that are not affordable housing, we'd be uh, required to provide one unit of affordable housing in the middle income category, which is, if you know about Amer area median incomes, it's in the 80 to 120% range, and that is often referred to as workforce housing. These units would be deed restricted for 30 years, meaning they have to be um, in that, uh, serving that income range for 30 years. And uh, they could be for rent, it could be for sale, it could be a combination. They have to be in Golden, or in uh, sites that have approximate uh, access to uh, key amenities and or transit. Next, please. We're gonna stop there. Um, that's a lot of information and there's a lot more. Hopefully we gave you a high enough level of information and touched on enough topics that your interest is piqued and uh, now we just wanna um, let you ask your more particular questions and do our best job to, to give you the information you're looking for. Thank you. Okay, John, if you wouldn't mind, uh, stop sharing. And then Stephanie, if you could allow me to share once that is accomplished. Okay, uh, we, uh, as, as, as Dan mentioned, we will move into the Q&A portion of the meeting and that leaves uh, over an hour for us to, to have those conversations, either uh, staff questions or for questions for the applicant. Uh, just, just a quick rundown, I mentioned some of this earlier, but you, uh, we want you to use the chat function to alert the panelists that you have a question. That's the, that's the sort of thought bubble at the very bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. Um, and again, you can either ask your question through chat in written form, or you can just ask to be brought into the meeting and ask your question. So let us know. And then just a reminder that, uh, that any comments you have specifically, no matter what's discussed here today, uh, please send those to that email address, planning commission at city of golden .net. Uh, Okay, and then before we get going here, these again are the topic areas uh, that we'll be covering. And so I'll, I'll I'll take this off the screen so that we can all see each other, but I wanted to remind you that we'll be going one by one through these and spending a, just a few minutes on each one. And then at the end, we'll, if we have time, we can, we can, uh, we can open it up to follow up questions as well. So with that, stop sharing. And uh, if people have questions about vesting, please, uh, please ask those now. You know, that's, that's one of the early components of the, of the official development plan. Uh, and I know there's been some questions out there in the public about that. So please come forward with your vesting questions now using the chat and we'll bring that into the meeting. Okay, any question, no, no questions yet on vesting? Okay, if not, we can move to the next topic here. Uh, we can circle back to vesting later. Uh, development process, is. are there any questions from anyone out there on the development process, how that would work, whether the whether questions about the ODP process, adoption process, or how how site plans would be reviewed in the future uh, hey, associated hey, with this? I time. had a question from someone. They want to know what is vesting? Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll give a brief version and then and, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll ask uh, Dan to explain their proposal. 
but vesting uh, is 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 a request for, from uh, an applicant, such as Course Tech, to have their property rights associated with their zoning uh, put in place for a set amount of time. Uh, so, for example, if the zoning is changed to PUD and this this official development plan is adopted, uh, the applicant is requesting that for 20 years a number of the the points, the a number of the um, elements of that zoning cannot be changed by the city during that 20 year period. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Dan address you know, the reason why they wanted to uh, request that of the city and, uh, and maybe some more details on, on, uh, on the vesting proposal itself. Thanks, Rick. And uh, John, if you wanna put up a slide. Um, so, right, what Rick said, um, vesting means that we agree to a set of rules um, that are embodied in the PUD and that they can't change for a period of time. What's different, hopefully you got this impression already from our, our presentation this evening about this project, is that it's gonna cover the equivalent of five city blocks. It's gonna take 10, 15, 20 years to build um, at a minimum 10 to 15 years. And that's if we don't have future unexpected disruptions to our economy or our society, like, I don't know, pandemic or something like that. So what this means is that the rules wouldn't change out from under us, that we can agree through this process that we're going through right now uh, with Planning Commission making whatever recommendation it does and City Council making its decision, that those rules wouldn't change. And our hope is that we all see that redeveloping this property under the PUD is better for everyone than redeveloping the property under the existing zoning. And if people in fact do feel that way, and therefore the PUD is approved, that we're asking for the time to deliver on all of those commitments. What would be very difficult and problematic because this is a, a multi-phase project, and just so everyone know, you know, it takes about three years to deliver one building. You have to design it, go through the site development plan process, get a building permit, then it takes about two years for a typical building to design, to, to build it and occupy it. So these things happen slowly over time, and the vesting would give us the time to deliver on all the commitments that we've agreed to in the PUD without the rules changing underneath us. I hope that is a sufficient answer. Uh, and Dan, I'll, we can we can kind of maybe uh, both staff and and uh, and the applicant can answer this. But there were a couple more questions about vesting. One was, is it normal and customary for cities to allow a 20-year vesting period? And uh, also, uh, what is the typical vesting period for PUDs? And I guess I I, I would say from the staff level, uh, you know, it's it's all up to negotiation. So PUDs are an opportunity to make a proposal and for uh, the city to negotiate that. So it could be anything. Uh, I don't know that 20 years is, is typical. Um, we have had a couple 20 year vesting periods in Golden in the past. Um, one of them was a vacation for Calvary Church. Uh, and another vesting period was, I just found out this today, I was looking at the annexation agreement for the Course Technology Park when we annexed that from, into the city from Jefferson County in 1998. That was a 20 year vesting period. but. Uh, the short answer is it can be anything uh, that we want it to be as long as there's an agreement. And uh, um, I think staff's, uh, staff felt that uh, advised planning commission that maybe 10 years is a more reasonable time frame because 20 years does seem a little long, but um, I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, the applicant answer that question as well. Thanks. Yeah, I don't think there's an inherent answer about what the right period of time is. It depends on how big a project is how long it might take to achieve. So uh, something with a couple buildings, a shorter period of time might make sense. Something like this with many buildings built over five city blocks over a decade or two um, it requires more time. And any, oh, let's see. Uh, we. Uh, there was a question related to that. Uh, why are all the workforce housing rules vested for 20 years? I'll, I'll let uh, Dan answer that. Sure. 
Uh, right now, the city has no requirement for any kind of affordable housing whatsoever. And we've committed to 10% of workforce housing, 10% of the housing we built to be workforce housing, as I previously explained. Um, will the city adopt some kind of requirements around affordable housing in the future? We don't know. I don't know that anyone knows for certain. There's analysis and staff who may be working on those things. Um, the, the, the short answer is we're trying to make commitments about things, some of which we think are particularly good for the community, but frankly are not what a typical developer would, would include because they don't help um, the project economics. So what we're saying is we're willing to make this substantial commitment compared to the current requirement of 0%. But we just want to know that that's what the commitment is, and again, that the, it won't be shifting under us midstream. It's a long project with a lot of phases. It's very complex to make these decisions on timing of when you build, what kind of use, and how you deliver them. And having certainty is of real value to us. Okay. We, um, let's move on to development process. And there's a question that uh, relates to development process. If something happens and Cortec wants to transfer all or part of the property to another entity, would that new entity have to abide by the PUD rules, commitments, and restrictions? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, yes, that the official development plan would become the zoning for this property when it's adopted, if it's adopted. And those rules would be in place no matter who the owner is in the future. Um, any any A1 else for a question on development process? We have a question for housing, but we'll get to that here. Uh, there are no questions about, oh, I guess there are no more questions about the uh, housing. So maybe that's a segue. Um, let's see. So, so oh, oh, oh. it sounds as if uh, in the area of question, I mean, so where's the and how that would be determined? Uh, the applicant want to take that one? Uh, you were a little garbled for me. Are we taking the workforce housing question? Yeah, we're moving on to workforce okay. housing. Uh, and the question is, uh, it sounds as if workforce housing would not necessarily be located within the area of the site. Uh, can you clarify where this would be and how that would be determined? The requirement would be that all of the workforce housing be delivered within the city of Golden quite a small community, and um, we are confident that uh, wherever it goes, it would serve the purposes that uh, we're hoping it will achieve, which I outlined previously. Um, our uh, PUD comes with timing requirements tied to delivery of market rate housing. So when we're building market rate housing, it, it triggers a requirement to deliver workforce housing, and we would have options on how um, it gets delivered. Uh, I, Rick, or perhaps uh, Rick's colleague, if she's on the call, can speak to the importance of that flexibility of um, being able to provide the workforce housing in the way that it's needed at the time that it, uh, it's required. But we'd be able to build it on site. We'd be able to build it off site. If the city adopts an in lieu fee for, public ho for affordable housing in the future, we'd have the option of paying that fee to the city, which the city could then use for affordable housing. Or we could um, purchase um, market rate units and convert them to deed restricted affordable housing. Uh, Rick, if you want to, you can speak to any of the more details on location. It can't go anywhere in Golden. It has to be proximate to transit. I'll let Rick speak to that. Right. The way, the way it's presented now, um, the, the applicant is requesting that flexibility that could be on-site or off-site. Uh, staffs, uh, you know, we, we negotiated this uh, version of this for, for a commission to consider uh, that, that, that if it is off-site, that that uh, location of, of workforce housing would need to be uh, close to transit and services like retail and, su and such. Um, and, and schools and workplaces, et cetera. So uh, the idea is not to put it in the far corner of the community, but in a 
in an area of the community that is well served, um, even if it's not on the site itself. Um, so that's something that uh, I know some people would rather have. I've seen comments where some people would have all would rather have all of it on site, um, but that's how the applicant is proposing it currently. Um, let's see, we're getting a, a number of things that I might not be able to keep up with here. A lot of a lot of chat. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the question is, um, what is the timeline for workforce housing? And maybe Dan, you want to take that? Sure. Um, the affordable housing will be triggered again by the delivery of market rate housing. Um, we would have, I believe, it's 18 months to fund um, if we're if we're contributing in lieu or or purchasing, and a longer period. I'm sorry, I don't. I'd have to. Um, refer to the ODP document in front of me, closer to two years um, to deliver um, the workforce housing if we're constructing it. Because we'd have to find a site, design it, permit it, build it. Uh, there was a question, and this, this, uh, this is definitely for, for the applicant. Could the requirements be changed to comply with current and future requirements instead of being restricted for 20 years under the vesting proposal? That is an option. Um, again, the requirement today is zero. So we thought it was significant and meaningful to us, and we hoped it would be meaningful to the community that we were making a 10% commitment. If there's overwhelming support or the belief that, well, the city's going to adopt stuff in the future, and why don't you just be subject to that, we would consider withdrawing our commitment to workforce housing in our PUD and just being subject to whatever it is the city may adopt in the future. Uh, there's another question here about workforce housing and whether or not it needs to follow the same rules in the ODP as the rest of the development, such as sustainability and open space, et cetera. Um, I can answer that. The answer is yes. Anything that's built on site would have to follow uh, those requirements in the official development plan. Um, and then uh, let's see, housing flexibility is important, which is why the requirements need to be somewhat flexible. Um, will Coors Tech consider focusing exclusively or primarily on deed restricted workforce housing to help lower to mid, lower to mid income residents build wealth? So right now it's geared towards workforce housing, which is often termed middle income housing. This, this would be on the, on the lower end of that lower income housing and moderate income housing. So the question is, would you consider that and making it deed restricted? Um, well, just to be clear, what we're committing to is 30 years of deed restricted workforce housing in the 80 to 120 percent AMI. If the question is, would we consider a low, serving a lower income level that probably wouldn't traditionally, depending on the level, be considered workforce housing? Yes, we would consider that. We'd have to consider that as part of a holistic package of changes that we might make. Um, for a, a little bit of a big picture understanding, it, you can use the idea of an equation. Uh, there are things that um, uh, allow us to do development and help pay for the things that um, are, are, are great but may not um, have a financial return on them. And we have to understand both sides of the equation how much we can build and how much we're committing to that that's um, not revenue producing to, to give an ultimate answer. So yes, we're willing to consider that. We've had conversations with folks about it, but it, we have to um, consider that as part of an overall PUD. Hmm. Uh, okay, and this is this is sort of a combination workforce housing sustainability question. Will will the sustainability promises translate to the workforce housing if it's offsite instead of onsite? The sustainability practices um, for, oh, you know, hadn't thought of that, honestly. Um, if we were building off-site something, I, I believe at the moment that PUD does not stipulate requirements with regard to sustainability off-site. 
but that's something that we can um, evaluate now that this commenter has raised the question. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm really, uh, this, this question is says, I'm really excited that housing is being discussed as part of this development. Can the applicant explain why this is so unique and why hasn't the city made a standard, made it a standard feature of development? I guess part of that is just for city staff to answer. Um, and uh, from the city's, city standpoint, um, I, I think the city would like to move in the direction of, of having requirements for affordable housing. And that's uh, what, uh, and, and, and Janet may want to uh, come in and discuss this a little bit as well, but uh, she is currently working on a project to uh, create an assessment for, for strategic uh, goals associated with housing and, and something like that may be an outcome uh, of, of that study as a recommendation. Anything to add there, Janet, or? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I think um, council's really been excited about moving more toward this direction of, of putting some definitions around workforce or affordable housing. Um, I was hired in November. I mean, that was sort of a big step toward them really wanting to start to put some definitions around it, but we wanna do it in a thoughtful way. So that's why we've sort of uh, just received funding from the state to commission a study to figure out what is the right way to do that in Golden? What is the right um, percentage? What is the right type? What is, is it things like fee and loo, or could it be, um, you know, exactly what Dan is proposing? So we're gonna kind of look at that in a holistic uh, study and hopefully have some answers um, by the middle of the year. Great, thank you, Janet. Uh, there's a question that, that asks, can the city require workforce housing to be on site? Uh, the, the short answer is is no, we, we don't have the ability to require workforce housing at all at this point. Um, it, it would, uh, it could be, it could be something that is a requirement of this ODP approval if, if that's if that's what uh, Planning Commission and Council feel, but in general, we cannot uh, just outright require that. It's not in our city code. Let's see here. Would workforce housing, if located offsite, be in areas already zoned for multifamily housing? Uh, yes, it would. It would need to be in in a properly zoned area. If it's if it's workforce housing that's multifamily, which which most is, it would need to have uh, a zoning designation that allows multifamily housing. Okay. Okay, and I think this is this we we already received this. This is um, do these requirements still apply if the workforce housing is offsite? I think you were uh, saying it, Dan. You were you were saying that it doesn't currently. It's not addressed in the ODP for offsite, but it's something that you could potentially consider um, any amendments to your to your proposal. Um, okay, would. Oh, the work with the workforce housing. Is it uh, is it possible to focus on for sale workforce housing rather than rather than rentals? With the idea being to uh, the help commitment, people build wealth. Yeah, the commitment in the PUD leaves the option for uh, a combination of those. It doesn't specify. It could be for rent, for sale, or both, as as the need presents itself. And there's, there's right. a need for both. Right, so maybe a, a follow-up question, and I'm, I'm not the person asking the question, but uh, follow-up to that might be, um, would you be willing in the future to commit to some split of, of for sale versus rental? That might be something to consider as well. That'd be something to consider, and I would probably have a conversation with Janet about it as well. We, we wanna make sure that what we're doing has impact at the time that we're doing it and flexibility um, can be key to making sure that happens. Yeah, uh, there's a comment that uh, much of the course tech workforce would be in that 50 to 80% AMI range, which would be below the 80 to 120% per workforce. Um, I don't know if you can comment on that. That's That was just a statement made. Um, I cannot I speak educatedly okay. about the uh, current and future workforces salary range. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Would you, so, and then there's a follow-up question, would, would Coors Tech expand the range to cover this lower, uh, lower income group, the 50 to 80 percent? I believe our already answer that is that's something we're willing to consider. Let's see. There's there's a there's a question. Um, it's uh, and, and maybe let's uh, let's let's keep going. I think we're, we're we're kind of running out of those questions, and we should move on to our next topic, uh, which is district art. Does anyone have any district art questions? And remember, that's the provision that uh, that the uh, the applicant would would uh, contribute up to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for public art. Uh, Dan, do you want to address that? That's with the with the construction of the first building. The requirement would be a minimum of seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. The greater of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, or two percent of the cost of the first building which could end up being substantially more. Okay. It all has to be spent Eight. on art, on site, uh, on art that can be viewed from public spaces. I'm not talking about, it's not art in a conference room in somebody's office building is not eligible. Hmm. Uh, question, would the Golden Public Art Commission choose the art projects for the site? The short answer is no. It doesn't mean that the Public Art Commission couldn't have a say or influence. Um, I'll let Rick speak to the purview of the Golden Public Art Commission, but the reason we use the terminology in our PUD is district art instead of public art. Technically, public art is art owned by the city on city of public property. This is art paid for by Coors Tech on Coors Tech property but in the public realm and viewable to any member of the public. So slight distinction there, which is why we don't choose to use the word public art. Right, and the Public Art Commission view does view art in, in terms of city right-of-way or city property, so parks and streets and so forth where, uh, where there are public art installations that you see around town, but not private. Uh, but that sounds like something the applicant is willing to consider as part of their decision-making process, but they can perhaps provide more details later. Um, if there are, I don't see any other, pub, uh, I don't see any other, other district art questions. Uh, why don't we move on to historic preservation? Um, uh, let's see, oh wait, before we do that, will the support for arts include golden artists? Would you, would you be employing golden artists to uh, provide the public art or the private art in the public realm? Uh, yes, we've made a specific uh, effort to include language that says we focus on local artists. We want to make sure we get a variety of artists from diverse perspectives and per diverse backgrounds. So if that's not fully achievable locally, um, we, we go elsewhere. Um, we've talked to Foothills uh, Art Center as, as helping us and others potentially helping us um, find artists, secure artists. Um, but we want to make sure that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the art really contributes to making this place feel uniquely of Golden. And it doesn't mean that you can't do that um, with some art from folks who don't live in and around Golden, but we'd really like to focus on local artists. Okay, uh, let's let's go on to historic preservation. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the applicant's proposal for historic preservation on site? And just as background, one of the new commitments uh, between the uh, first submittal of the official development plan at, at Planning Commission and the revised submittal was to specifically preserve building one, that's the brick building uh, along Ford Street that uh, the applicants showed in their slideshow. 
um, that is that is a more specific commitment as well as uh, agreeing to survey the other buildings on site for um, our, in their architectural inventory. Right. There are, there are a number of commitments, Rick, to sort of quickly refer to them. One is to do a, um, a, a thorough architectural um, inventory of all the buildings on the site over 50 years old using state of Colorado um, standards and requirements, and then re sharing that report with the city and agreeing to meet with the city to discuss um, the findings of it, none of the industrial buildings have been surveyed uh, and none of them have historic designations. So we're willing to undertake that research, share it with the city, and talk about it. Uh, but at a minimum, we've um, committed to preserving multiple buildings and one of those buildings, regardless of what the survey finds, would be that building one, which is the building that most people are familiar with on Ford with the brick facade and the Coors porcelain stenciled on its um, here it's Ruth. Okay. Uh, why don't we move on to sustainability? I'm not seeing other uh, any, any historic preservation comments or questions. Uh, so let's move on to sustainability. Does Does anyone have any questions for uh, the applicant about uh, the plan for sustainability in the official development plan? I'll just say while we're waiting for questions. Oh, okay, here's a question. Yeah. Uh, any plans for on-site energy generation? Yes, we have a minimum requirement of 10% on-site renewable. That's um, the logical amount that we know we can commit to given the, the size and footprints of these buildings. And then to achieve net zero energy will be uh, co collaborating with the city or continue conversations with the city and others to see if we can procure or secure off-site renewable energy as part of a community solar garden to um, fully offset the balance of the energy required for the site. As I mentioned in um, our presentation, we're also exploring uh, tapping into um, ground source, um, so thermal, geothermal, and uh, even potentially uh, heat from um, sewer uh, activities. This okay. is a slide that represents sort of our, our four tiers of uh, sustainability approach. Okay. Uh, there's a question, how would the development be water wise and resilient to changing climate? Yeah, um, if it's all right, I'd like to bring our sustainability consultant, Josh Radoff in. Josh, can you speak to that please? Sure. Um, so yeah, in the in the revised uh, PUD, there's a number of things that address water, and I think one, given the fact that every building will be LEED Gold certified, um, that kind of has some uh, likelihood that it's going to grab some things in the water. But to strengthen that, we added a minimum 30% uh, indoor water efficiency requirement um, and a 50% outdoor water efficiency requirement uh, using LEED's methodologies for establishing a baseline and demonstrating reductions. Um, and then so the flip side of that, uh, or not the flip side, but um, in addition to water efficiency, um, we um, were are also sort of doing this sort of uh, a green infrastructure plan. So all the rainwater that's sort of falling on site, the idea is to sort of channel that rainwater through kind of vegetated areas. So it's sort of starting to better replicate kind of natural um, systems. Um, so those are the sort of main kind of water uh, related elements uh, of the project. Uh, Dan mentioned um, geothermal or sewer heat recovery. Uh, implicit in those um, would be significant water savings. Um, so those are things that we're exploring for various feasibility. But um, if we did those, then it would mean that we'd have a far fewer need for uh, cooling towers uh, and cooling towers are, are big water users. So that's potentially another uh, water uh, saving element that we might um, have as part of the project. Uh, this this next question uh, has to do with net zero and it's it's kind of getting at the root of the flexibility that you're asking for around that with uh, in terms of 
uh, you know, on a building by building basis versus a district wide approach to sustainability and, you know, the flexibility of, of, of having some of that net zero uh, not happen on a, on a building or, or much of it not happen building by building, but site wide and um, explain how that would work better. I'll start and then I'd like to ask Josh to, to kick in. Just to be clear, what we're committing to is at a baseline, at a minimum, what city requirements are. So uh, we're not seeking any flexibility to have lower standards. There's no requirement for net zero energy in the city today. There's a standard for sites like ours to have 10% on-site renewable, and that's what we would do at a minimum. That's really shaped by your roof area, and um, that's why you can't put all the you know solar panels you need um, for the whole site um, uh, 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 on the roofs. Um, Josh, do you want to speak further to that, please? Yeah, I think it's a good question, and there's a lot to say about net zero energy. I think I'd first like to say that you know the the definition of net zero energy has evolved uh, over. Uh, really in the last five years significantly. I think, you know, previously the idea was that uh, a building would produce all the energy it needed on an annual basis um, on site. Um, uh, and um, that, I mean, the challenge with that is that it really precludes any building taller than two or three stories. Um, so anytime you have buildings uh, or projects um, that are that are taller than that, um, there's a need to have uh, energy, renewable energy, come from offsite sources. So um, we are essentially referencing definitions. Um, there, there's a couple of definitions and certification programs out there. I think one of the challenges about committing to net zero energy is just needing to agree on what the definitions are. So um, one of the definitions that, that we've been using the most, I would say, stringent and credible um, that exists is from the International Living Future Institute. This is the group that develop the living building challenge. Um, they have both net zero energy and net zero carbon uh, certification programs, um, each of which could act on a district basis. So in my mind, you know, it doesn't make sense to look at each, indivi each individual building as separate entities, but to sort of aggregate total energy use across there uh, and then look at the renewable energy required. And so um, again, we think looking at the amount of roof area available um, and given the building heights and the amount of energy use that would be uh, take place within there, you know, 10% on site is a good is a good starting point goal, a good minimum goal. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Uh, I think more. Uh, I would. I don't know about more importantly, but but equally important is that those definition or that definition also requires all electric buildings. And so doing all electric buildings from a carbon perspective will have a really huge impact. And, and so that's a really big commitment as part of this program. Um, so buildings will be efficient. They'll have on-site renewable energy. Um, they will have off-site renewable energy and they'll be all electric. Um, we further, uh, one of the programs, the net zero carbon program from International Living Future Institute also includes looking at the embodied carbon of the materials. So that's another element that we'll look at. We'll 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 essentially see an embodied carbon is uh, how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions went into making the materials, which can be significant for things like steel, cement, and aluminum. So reusing the existing buildings really helps there, but also we'll we'll sort of demonstrate a reduction, a 10% reduction, which is aligned with that net zero carbon standard. So. We so if we do all those sort of things, we will be net zero carbon at least or net zero energy certifiable. Or you know we could go get a certification, and that will be and and we will do that. The only sort of thing that we want to make sure of is that our source of, that there is a source of offsite supply for us. Uh, Colorado has a community solar garden program. If that exists and there's and there and there's availability, then we'll participate in that and we'll be done. And then we're net zero energy. Or net zero carbon program. Uh, I think we just want to make sure that when the when when it, the the buildings are built, that there actually exists a community solar garden uh, out there for us to participate in. And if it does, um, great. So I don't know if that sort thanks, of helps Josh. to address. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And, and just to make sure, we fully answer the question about the sort of the district um, aspect of this, because we are building a variety of buildings. Uh, over time in a whole district. Um, the only uh, flexibility we're looking for uh, on this is the ability to overbuild on some portions of the site and underbuild on others 
so that overall each building in the entire site achieves net zero energy. This is different than current code where each building one at a time independently would have to comply with whatever current sustainability requirements there are. Right now, the things that Josh ticked off are not part of the city's requirements. Buildings are not required to be all electric, they're not required to be net zero energy, et cetera, and we're committed to doing those things. Yeah, uh, that is correct. It's not required currently, as as uh, as the applicant knows, and, and and those on the call that we we are embarking on a an effort to uh, to to get a net zero uh, community outreach effort going, and, uh, and and seek to define those rules. But that is correct. There are no net zero rules currently. Um, I have a couple more questions here about sustainability, and then we can we can move on to another topic. But uh, let's see, can can Josh speak to how efficient a building needs to be to be built to allow, jumping around on me a little bit, to allow the district-wide net zero energy to be achieved? I think you might have addressed a little bit of that. Well, I, no, that's a good question. Uh, with regard to the, like, how efficient does a building have to be? I mean, if you're using yeah. the, the old version, then the, you need it to be efficient enough to, to have all of your on-site production, on-site renewables uh, meet your annual load. As soon as you have offsite, you do need an efficiency requirement. So the International Living Future uh, Institute, the you know the, the standard that I mentioned, um, requires meeting a 25% improvement over ASHRAE 90.1 2010, <laughs> which is also that's also the lead baseline. Um, so uh, so our project will will certainly do that. Uh, we've committed to an 8% reduction over uh, a, a different standard, IECC International Energy Conservation. Uh, code uh, from 2018. Um, so we're improving on the city's current efficiency requirement um, and that by doing so based on our sort of preliminary analysis would, would easily clear the uh, ASHRAE 25 percent, sorry, the ILFI is 25 percent over uh, ASHRAE 2010. So we're in the weeds here, uh, but uh, it's a good question. <laughs> I see Dan, Dan does it, sort of tries to keep me out of the weeds, um, but it is a good question. And there is an efficiency standard associated with these, and we presume to meet those. I think for the layperson, by being lead gold and all electric, we are, uh, and then some of these additional uh, reduction standards that we've committed to that are in the PUD document today, that gets us to the level of efficiency we would need. Okay, one more, one more, and I think this is a quick one uh, before we move on to, uh, to parking and traffic. Uh, are passive house performance standards under consideration? Uh, passive house builds are actually easier to achieve for larger units. So uh, yeah, so passive house is a is a standard that sort of drives efficiency, um, focusing on envelope improvement. So I, I would say that we've we've sort of talked about passive house, and we sort of consider that maybe uh, the means by which we would achieve our efficiency standard. Um, and so something that we may sort of continue to sort of have in our sort of design quiver as we sort of move uh, through this, maybe for certain building types um, or select buildings, um, but it's not something that we feel like we need to or is appropriate to sort of commit to at this stage. I think it's more important to have the efficiency requirement and then if we, um, you know, if we want to sort of use an approach like Passive House to, to get there, then, then we may sort of do that down the road. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, traffic and parking. Uh, this first question is related to uh, uh, the, the, the TDM proposal, uh, mostly it is. Uh, let's see, is, is there interest in accelerating electric vehicles and high occupancy commuting? And then there's a number of things listed here. Are there ideas to discourage private vehicle use, price car use and parking, promote transit uh, and shared mobility, and ensure the development is transit oriented or has the potential to be served by public transit and bike share and such. So maybe you can kind of speak to all of those uh, elements of, of uh, TDM and uh, where, where you sit on that, Dan. I'm gonna give the short answer then I'm gonna ask our, our parking specialist, Jeremiah, to speak uh, perhaps further. Um, the short answer is yes to everything the question articulated. And that's what we were trying to uh, refer to when we were talking about reducing single occupancy vehicles and providing incentives to help people get to and from the site 
uh, including in the middle of the day, maybe they've driven and now they need to go somewhere, but we have car share, bike share, um, amenities on site, amenities in downtown that people can walk to. Um, so um, those types of tools that are in this question are typical in the transportation demand management program. Uh, most, if not all of those, are specifically identified in our parking study and our TDM um, transportation demand analysis menu. Um, we would have to um, use measures off of that menu to achieve our any reduction. And if we wanted to change the menu, we have to get city approval to do that. So things like um, paying for employees' RTD passes, I mentioned on-site car share, on-site uh, bike share, um, shuttles to and from, all of these things um, are tools that, to help people uh, move around in ways other than their car. Jeremiah, would you add anything to that? No, Dan, that was very well articulated. The bucket of tools, we've outlined about 24 strategies and whoever posted the comment had some great suggestions. Um, I think everything on that list um, we had captured in some form or another in our transportation demand management strategy toolbox. And as Dan said, the aim of each of these is to reduce the use of single occupancy vehicle to commute to and from the site and also promote kind of the walkability and bikeability of folks already on the site um, back to downtown Golden and reduce the reliance on the, the vehicle trip. John, would you mind zooming in on that TDM strategy menu? It's too small for most people to. And Dan, this was my bad, but with 24 strategies, I only included one page on that table. So what we're showing here is about a third, a third of the toolbox, and we can certainly provide more information on all 24 strategies in the plan. Just to be clear, these are not strategies that we've invented that are unique to our team or this project. These are best practices nationally for uh, developers and communities that want more sustainable, lower traffic uh, urban environments that emphasize walking and biking uh, in addition to moving around by car. I think that answers it, Rick. Okay. Yeah, there's, um, there's another uh, TDM related question, transportation and management. Uh, Google and Boulder benefits program offering employees $5 a day if they come by bus or don't bring a car and use alternative modes. Um, and then they'd receive $2.50 a day if they had, uh, uh, and also had free transit passes, uh, uh, bike share passes and, and van pool incentives, et cetera. Um, and I think the question is, is this appropriate or achievable, this type of framework appropriate or achievable for course tech uh, related to transportation? Well, we'll do the same response. The short answer is yes, 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 and yes. And they're all included in our um, EDM strategy. And Jeremiah, do you want to add anything to that? I like the short answer, yes. Those are great suggestions um, and in our toolbox. Okay. Uh, this one, how are you going to prevent the traffic from getting more congested here in Golden? Your proposals have been promised and tried in other locations, but have failed. The end result will only create more traffic and congestion in Golden, and people will continue to drive their vehicles. Um, so I guess the question is, how are you going to prevent that from happening? I'm gonna, I, well, we'll do the same kind of handoff again. Uh, a couple things. Uh, growth is happening in our country, in our state, in the Front Range and Golden. And at the moment, that's, that's a reality. Uh, at, uh, at the moment, also, I would say, unfortunately, a lot of that growth comes with more traffic. All that we've just been talking about for the past three or four minutes, about finding ways to get people to commute or move around uh, and be incentivized to use modes other than driving alone is a big part of how we do it. Um, let's see. Jeremiah or Curtis, do you want to um, – oh, I, I want to say one other thing, which is um, this site has been in, uh, in commercial operation for over 100 years. 
it's going to be uh, used uh, for some kind of mix of uses of, uh, for the next 100 years. So traffic will be generated um, until such time as um, folks like us work hard to get people out of their cars or there's a broader societal shift. We're not counting on people giving up their cars, but we're putting all of these measures into place to help motivate people to choose something other than their car. Jeremiah or Curtis, would you have anything to add to that? Maybe I'll ask Curtis to jump in on the trip, the traffic impact question. Curtis, our, our, um, our um, traffic planner, do you want to say anything about the conclusions of the traffic study? So we did a traffic study to analyze just this question. What we had to study, which intersections, the methodology, all that was uh, um, guided and ultimately approved by city staff. And then the study was uh, reviewed by the city engineer and its outside consultant. And um, if Curtis wants to speak up, he can share the conclusions. If not, I will. Yep, here, here I am. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Curtis Rowe, Kimley Horn. Um, so we provided a very conservative analysis. We use the uh, highest potential mix of um, development uses that, that could occur on site uh, to do our traffic analysis and, and assuming that, you know, the status quo of uh, traffic generation occurs with this development. Um, traffic generated by this project can and will be successfully accommodated on the surrounding street network. Um, so, you know, this is a good location for this development. It has good access and good accessibility and um, street network adjacent that has uh, plenty of capacity available. Can you, can you just uh, restate for us the number of extra cars that would occur in the future during what's known as the peak hours? Yes, so this project would generate um, above what is currently being generated on the site. Um, it's approximately 700 peak hour trips. Uh, we're looking at 635 morning peak hour trips uh, new to the street network and then 780 which would occur in the afternoon thanks okay uh this this is i think a question about you know shared the mix of uses and shared parking how much parking will be provided on site to support anticipated day use visitors and residents versus parking for employees And I well, don't know uh, if you can get into specifics at this point, but um, but maybe yeah, maybe the philosophy yeah. at least. Yeah, I'll tag team with. Uh, it's a rather somewhat complicated answer, but I'll tag team with Jeremiah. Again, uh, the project will be built in phases. So uh, today, there's 161 parking spaces in that surface parking lot on 10th and Ford that Coors Tech makes available for free for public parking. At a minimum at full build out of the most intensive scenario that we have considered, we'd be required to build 1,700 plus parking spaces on the site. Uh, according to the data that we've collected from the city, that's hundreds of spaces more that are currently available in the entirety of downtown. The short answer is a lot of parking. Um, do you want to add any color to that, Jeremiah, in terms of sort of availability to whom and when? Sure. So Dan stated that well, the mix that we ran was the most um, traffic intensive, which, you know, would, would have a large component of office users. Um, the, you know, the who's using the parking and will depend a lot on what times of day. So nights and weekends, the parking will be predominantly available for, for visitors and downtown visitors, the general public. Um, at a worst kind of peak, mid-morning, afternoon, um, of those 1,700 parking stalls, you know, 300 plus would be expected to serve office and retail visitors to the site. Um, and then that mix will change 
Um, I imagine there will be a parking operator um, operating parking and will uh, make sure that the parking garage is, is open and that that employee parking becomes open for visitors as employees are to leave throughout the afternoon. Right. It, in order for us to successfully have a project where we have tenants who pay rent, pay for the expensive buildings we built, we need to make sure there's enough parking for the tenants, whether they be residential, office, or otherwise, and that there's enough parking for people visiting those tenants. Um, so that's what Jeremiah is referring to. And, and then particularly on nights and weekends, off office hours, um, there would just be, a, a, you know, a potentially tenfold times more parking available than currently available on the site. The table on the upper right here is the shared parking concept that Dan explained in visual format. Uh, shared parking is not new anytime you go to, you know, a mixed use area downtown, essentially you're demonstrating shared parking principles. An employee might use a space during the day and in the evenings and weekends might be a restaurant or entertainment use. Uh, the models that we use are, are quite a bit more granular, as you can see, and uh, sort projected parking demand by hour of the day. You can see the distribution curves on the right. Um, this illustrates the concept, the largest grayed out area is our monthly employee parking um, that would be provided or needed under this particular mix of development density. And the peaks of the permit holders are at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and two, three o'clock in the afternoon. But you can see there's quite a lot of other user groups on site um, at different times. Let me uh, speak to um, one more aspect of this question, if that's all right, Rick. Um, yeah, we, we do need to move on because we have a few more topics to cover and we're really running out of time. So just briefly, if you could. Okay, 30 seconds. Uh, what happens if all these efforts to get people to take uh, modes other than cars to go to work or to get people to work from home part of the time are not as successful as we hope they will be? The PUD has um, requirements that kick in as mitigation and uh, just Briefly, it means we have to pay the city a fee that the city could use to build more parking, we have, or we have to build more parking than we otherwise would be obliged to, or we have to uh, do more transportation demand management to more aggressively get down the number of cars coming each day. I'll stop there. Okay, uh, and this one I think could be a, a pretty quick one. Who's responsible for ensuring a, six, a successful TDM program? Is it the developer or individual businesses? It's the site? owner. Sorry, did you want to say something about that? Well, no, I mean, you might want to talk about the, the manager uh, yeah. role that, that was inserted into the ODP. Right. Um, with a little bit of context, it's Coors Tech's uh, intention, the Coors family's intention to develop and own and operate all of the buildings built on the site, the entire project indefinitely. But uh, to make sure that there is an assurance, if for some reason that doesn't happen exactly as conceived, there's a TDM manager identified, and um, and and that uh, TDM manager would rest with the ownership of the collection uh, of the entire site, even if it was under multiple owners so that the obligation for TDM always stays with the land and the owner, regardless of who the owner is, and it's not on the tenant. It's on, on the, the project building owner. Okay, let's, um, let's, we have a number of other questions here, but we, we need to move on to other topics. If we have more time later, we can circle back to these. And of course, everyone who is on the call, we do have other meetings in the future, so you can always ask those questions at those later meetings and we'll, we'll display that at the end of the meeting uh, again for you. Um, let's move on to open space and landscaping. Does anyone have any questions about that aspect of the proposal? And if I may, while people are, are asking questions, again, we've scheduled three two hour uh, open office hours at the planning department. And if you wanna 
get much more granular or nerdy about traffic and parking, please stop by and we can talk in greater depth. Okay. I'm not seeing any open space and landscaping yet. Um, let's go to uh, the next one, which is permitted and prohibited uses. So those would be the allowed uses on site with the proposed official development plan. Uh, remember the current, the current zoning allows uh, a, a range of, of, of mixed uses, commercial uses, but it also allows manufacturing uses. The proposed new zoning would not allow those manufacturing uses, but would allow much of uh, the, the current uh, C2 uh, zoning in, in the city, which is uh, traditional retail office and, and mixed use with residential. So if there are any questions about the uses that are allowed or those that are prohibited, uh, please enter those questions now or we can bring it to the meeting. Can you reiterate what you said while you're waiting for questions? Sure. Um, under M2, which is 75% of our site, it's the most permissive zoning, and the C2 is the next most permissive zoning in, in town. We could pretty much, under existing zoning, build any use that's allowed to be built in the city, with maybe very narrow exception. We're eliminating some of those uses. And we talked about it briefly in our presentation, and Rick just said it as well. Industrial uses, drive-through restaurants, things like that. That's the short, easy answer. Okay, so so nothing on 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 uses so far. So let's move on to district design standards. Does anybody have any questions about the architectural elements of what is proposed? The the design aspects. Uh, that are found as standards and guidelines in what is being proposed in the ODP document. Uh, should uh, just should note that uh, those those standards uh, were discussed in the February second meeting, and the applicant made changes, some pretty significant changes between the February second uh, review process and the revised ODP that was submitted for uh, the latest planning commission meeting, which which hasn't. Hasn't really occurred yet, but uh, um, it will. Okay. Uh, there's a question: How does site plan review work, and how are those standards reviewed? Um, so I can I can explain that uh, because that that happens on the staff side. That is related to current code, and so this this site, of course, is 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 under a rezoning request, but no specific buildings or sites are planned. Uh, related to what is being proposed so far. So in the future, if this, if some version of this ODP is adopted in the future, each one of these new developments that come in uh, would be required to go through the site plan development review process. And that is a uh, involves a staff review uh, related to these code standards for site plans. That's architecture, landscaping, all the things that you think of uh, on the exterior of the building or on the site itself. It includes uh, utilities and uh, grading and drainage and all of those things as well. So all of that is reviewed by city staff, planners, engineers, uh, et cetera. And then there's a, uh, a, a, most of these go to planning commission for review, at least they do currently. And uh, they are the current final, final uh, decision on site plan review. Uh, but it has to meet the standards that are in the zoning code. So, the standards that, that would be used for the site plan process here, uh, the process would be the same. The standards would be specific to this ODP, this zoning that's being proposed here, unless it, it refers back to the, the city's code. So that's how, how the review would work. So anything that's not specified here in the ODP for site plan related requests would fall back towards the uh, city's own zoning code. So I think it's important to, to read that district design standard section with that in mind. But again, the, those standards were increased between the first submittal before commission and the, and the next submittal. Um, let's see, this one I think goes, puts us into the next and final category here, which is the building height section. Uh, what is the proposed setback on Washington Avenue? 
And is it different for upper floors than ground level? And maybe maybe John McIntyre or Dan could answer that question. Please, John. Yeah, I can take a look at that, and uh, I'm, I might just bring up some uh, uh, some documents to support that, so we can see it in diagram form. The short answer is yes. That the setback is. Uh, different at lower levels. We are proposing some additional ground floor setbacks on Washington Avenue than are required under the current zoning. Five foot setback would extend up Washington to enable us to provide some additional amenity at the street edge, um, widen the sidewalks, provide street level planting. And then at the upper stories, we're proposing um, a uh, uh, an upper story setback um, that is also uh, deeper specifically on uh, on Washington Ave so that we have a slightly different condition on Washington Ave to the other streets. I'm just going to bring up a document that may that may have answered the question and we can maybe keep going with it but yeah and I can there's 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 another question that's related to height and and I can uh, I can bring in something to share as well here. Um, Stephanie would you mind giving me that uh, that power? Let's see, so this this was provided in the uh, the packet to Planning Commission, but it shows, uh, you know, essentially what the current heights uh, would allow now or or soon to be in the future with the with the zone code rewrite. So so the bulk of the site is M2. That's this this big area here, and that allows 65 feet of height across the board. There's no there's no step backs on upper floors. It's it's just a 65 foot height. Um, from, from lot line to lot line around the around the perimeter. Um, of course, currently there are some structures on the site that are taller than that, um, as, as I think the applicant noted in their presentation. Uh, the two other adjacent areas are uh, are have a different height. Uh, that's that's uh, for the C2 area down here. That's a 50 under the new code. That would be 55 foot height with step backs um, associated with that. Um, some pretty uh, steep setbacks, and, and I think the applicant used a lot of that for their model for how to do stepbacks as well, um, at least elements of it. And then this section up here up at the corner near Highway 58, uh, under the proposed zoning code, that would be a 38-foot height maximum also with uh, some stepbacks. So, um, and this is what the applicant is proposing here on the right, um, the 65-foot height for the site would would still play for the for much of the interior of the site, but again, as as um, Mr. McIntyre mentioned, that there would be step backs along Washington and Ford. Uh, this area of 60 foot height would have a step back of 50 feet here. This area here is 20 feet um, of step back um, before the upper floors go up. Um, any any comments from the applicants on that? I just wanted to kind of give a comparison here. Yeah, why don't I have another diagram that I can talk to that and may address a couple of the other questions that are coming up too around where those taller heights are and why. Um, sure. So maybe I can share well, the diagram. While you pull that up, John, let me just say yep. something that um, the graphic that uh, Rick is showing is from the ODP. It's a sort of a blanket plan. What it doesn't represent are all the contributions we're making to public benefit that take away area that we can actually build. So there's two streets we're committing to providing access through private property. Those are those are publicly accessible streets. Um, there's that 40% open space versus current 0% and the draft code 15%. So you get a lot more open space. That also, also of course, takes away the development capacity and height. And then there's the commitment requirement to preserve multiple existing buildings and that can also have an impact um, and and that's the sort of short answer for um, why we try to pick some targeted areas to uh, recapture um, some of the development area um, that uh, we'd be giving up from all of those other commitments and maybe as a summary of what dan's just said the diagram that you're seeing on screen currently as an analysis of on the left, the site under existing zoning in terms of its height limits and uh, street edge setbacks. And uh, on the right with the enhanced ground floor setbacks, 
uh, a slightly revised approach to height restrictions that differentiate, uh, and then the open space provision diagrammatically that um, Dan was talking about. And what we're really trying to illustrate here is the additional controls on developable volume within the site or developable area within the site and a side-by-side -side comparison to, to, to make that a little bit more apparent to, to you. So the right-hand side, you can see that open space requirement um, both at the streets and within the blocks um, really reducing the amount of developable area possible on the, on, on the site. On the left, without those streets and with a, a lower requirement for open space within the block, um, there's significantly more capacity. I think this is maybe useful to look at just orienting you with the, the uh, Golden High School building, the historic building on that bottom left corner, and obviously the highway on the back side, um, and Washington running down the left side of the site. Um, and in a, in a little comparison of on the left now, you can see those proposed adjustments that would come in under the new code amendment with a shift to 55 feet in this zone and uh, 38 feet. Maybe just to talk very briefly about why height adjustments and where. Um, the uh, three areas of localized height uh, increase that we're looking at, along with a couple of areas of localized height reduction. So the one is up in this top left corner to really enable the potential for a three-story building on the on the side of this corner, uh, which we think is a really important gateway corner. And that's currently held down a little bit by one of the design, uh, by one of the downtown overlays, um, looking to get up to 38 feet. So the difference between 38 and 50. At the low point of the site, and you can see the fact that this 50 foot height is actually higher than the 75 foot height over here. That's because this is the low point of the site and it's tucked hard up against the highway. So the intent there really was to, to provide some better integrated um, parking opportunities within the building and also bring the building into a better relationship from an urban <coughs> form standpoint with the highway and then providing areas of localized height reduction, this 50 feet zone, to kind of step that down into the existing historic buildings along that corner. So building one is uh, located right up in this corner, as, as you all know. And then um, the, the third localized area was down in this corner of the site which um, actually will sort of, on average, maybe equate to something not dissimilar to the new built form standard, where we're suggesting that the perimeter of the site is actually held down at 50 feet. Um, we don't think that that needs to be up to 55, um, but that the back section of that site could potentially come up um, to five feet. There's some topography within that uh, site. Um, we'd like to be able to integrate parking more effectively, and it gives a little bit more flexibility in terms of the types of building uses that could go there, for instance, uh, if there was an office building or a research building, um, would be better able to integrate that building within within that area. So those are the three areas where there's some localized height increase and, and reduction. And, and John, there was a, another height question while you were talking about uh, it's, it's relative to the highway. Uh, how tall are the buildings relative to the, to the highway behind it, at Highway 58? And perhaps that's mostly uh, related to the 75 foot height zone. In the back. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's right in here. So if I go to, uh, hopefully you're seeing screen at the moment, and if I just move through these, you'll see those are those three areas that we talked about, kind of highlighted in green and plan now with the highway up the back here. Um, a little visual of that just to give you a sense of it in three dimensions. Um, that, that 75 foot zone that we're talking about is in here. It is worth noting that that 75 foot height is not as high as, say, the existing building on the site, which is around 84 feet. So if, we, if you think about that larger existing building in the middle of the site, and then just looking at that in a cross section. Um, so this is a cross section with uh, Highway 58 right in this location. You can see the existing buildings in over the site, and you can see in blue uh, the existing zoning envelope, and in green, the proposed increases and in hatch blue, the proposed reductions um, to give that answer. Here's a 55 feet of height off the highway edge. So less than the 65 feet in terms of the height adjacent to the highway, we're actually getting a, a 55 foot height um, change between the highway and that proposed uh, 75 foot height limit right there. Does that give that explanation in terms of height relative to highway? I think uh, that seems to seems to cover it from what I can tell. The um, there's a there's another question though related. Are these heights from the current grade, or are you planning to change the grade? Um, is it associated with the future development? Well, the um, the city has a methodology for assessing the base plane for each of these buildings, the point at which that height is measured from, and that is taken from existing 
grade um, and it's averaging corners of the parcels. So they would be assessed on a parcel by parcel basis to allow the buildings to relate to their adjacent topography. Um, and it would be an approximation using the city's methodology of establishing a base plan for the site uh, that utilizes existing grade. Okay, thank you. I, I think uh, that, that probably covers the, the uh, building height section, which is the last component that we were covering today from the ODP. Um, I know we are out of time. It's 7.05. The meeting was scheduled to go until 7. Uh, if there are any any sort of general questions, I, I, Dan, do, do are you and your team able to, to stay for any additional questions for any amount of time if we were to open it up for a last couple of questions? Yes, we can stay on until 7.15. Okay, so we have uh, 10 more minutes. Uh, so if if anyone did not have their question answered or, uh, you know, we can uh, we can circle back or if you have a new question that came up through throughout this uh, topic by topic discussion, just let us know that as well. I just wanted to jump on and say I, um, I introduced myself earlier. I've been helping with community engagement. I've been keeping notes of which questions have not been answered yet. So if that's helpful, I can redirect us to some of those, but I'm happy to stay longer as well. Sure. Um, okay, here is a new one. Will 8th and 9th Street be accessible to cars? If so, does that conflict with the walkable district ambitions? The 8th and 9th Street, yes, will be accessible to cars, although we're, um, we've committed to different treatments of the two streets. So as folks know, um, from Washington to Jackson, so half of the uh, east-west uh, length of our site is already a public 9th Street. So we were, uh, we're committing to making uh, more street that would continue that all the way from Washington to Ford rather than stopping at Jackson. So with, um, um, with pavement and other design efforts, we hope to make sure that it can be used by all modes. 8th Street would be treated differently. Um, what we're going to do is a, what's called a Wooner, which is a Dutch term for shared street. Here's an image on the, the top left of this grid um, is is an example of that. It's probably cobblestone or some other kind of paver with bollards, et cetera, to really um, make it accessible to cars, but not for high speed through traffic, really to come in there and maybe access parking structures and get out slowly and to be much more user friendly to bikes and pedestrians. Great. Uh, this one I, I, I remember came up before. Uh, it was a question related to the Golden Mill and the parking demand that the Golden Mill has generated. And, and I think we all know that uh, Coors Tech has opened up their current parking lot for the Golden Mill to uh, uh, Golden Mill users to use. Uh, how will that change in the future? How will that uh, um, how will that demand be met? I suppose is is the question can't speak to what the demand is or uh, Golden Mill's obligation. Um, as I mentioned before, Coors Tech allows any member of the public, including people who patron the Golden Mill, as well as other downtown businesses, to use their parking lot for free. There's no limitation of if you're there for the Golden Mill or something else. Um, we don't charge anyone for that, and uh, there's no legal requirement that uh, we do that. Um, our anticipated first phase, this is a question I saw that wasn't answered before, would be north of 9th Street between 9th and what would be the new 8th Street. And so it was likely to be years before we developed that surface parking lot. Um, but again, when we do, we're going to replace it with potentially as much as 10 times as much parking as is there today. Um, if you want, uh, Something more specific about traffic parking demand for the Golden Mill, you'd have to ask the Golden Mill or someone from the city. I don't have that information. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't I don't know about specific demand and, and numbers associated with that. Um, I'll just I'll just relate that uh, the Golden Mill, because they don't have parking on site, received a parking variance from Planning Commission a few years ago. Uh, that variance requires Golden Mill to have an offsite have offsite parking requirement. 
agreements. Um, so uh, part of that is one of those agreements is with Core's Tech, um, but uh, those those if if the Core's Tech option goes away, it'll be uh, on the Golden Mill to find other options to park. Um, but I think what uh, the applicant is saying that what they're doing doesn't necessarily preclude uh, parking on their site in the future. Um, you know, related to the Golden Mill, um, it's just one one factor there. Um, but we're going to question. We're going to want public. We're going to want Golden Mill and other patrons to use our parking because it's going to be largely empty on nights and weekends. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the, going back to the shared use kind of model. Uh, uh, will there be any new traffic signals associated with course tech development? That might be a, a city engineer or Curtis Rowe question. Yes, I can answer that. Uh, no new traffic signals are needed uh, with the existing street network. Um, there is a possibility of signalizing the 9th Street intersection if the City of Golden is interested in changing the street section of Washington Avenue to include a single lane in each direction. But otherwise, as exists today, no new traffic signals are needed for this project. And just to yes. clarify uh, what Curtis said, we are not proposing as part of our project to change the street uh, width or number of lanes on Washington. Um, we are not proposing new signals and we are not proposing roundabouts. Those issues were studied in the traffic study uh, at the request of the city so that the city might consider at some point in the future whether um, collectively the city wants to make changes to Washington. But none of those changes are, are part of our proposal. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point of clarification. I know there was some confusion around that. Um, this one is another transportation related question related to TDM. Uh, I understand TDM and TDM plus have been used in urban setting, in urban settings mostly. Um, why do you think it will work in Golden? And uh, when you estimated the number of cars, do, you, do those numbers assume TDM is successful? Uh, Jeremiah, would you mind answering that one? Yeah, we, you know, we do think TDM will be successful in Golden. We've seen quite a few cities in Colorado use transportation demand management successfully. Uh, certainly the urban core, downtown Denver, has a lot of transit options, and that's one example. But we also see communities like Arvada, Estes Park, Manitou Springs, um, also successfully implement transportation demand management and move the needle on those single occupancy vehicle trips. Uh, the models that we show today do assume the TDM is successful. There are triggers in uh, the ODP which would um, ensure that the TDM is either successful or that the development um, takes steps to mitigate uh, the parking impacts if we're not hitting uh, the targets that we had. Um, I will tell you the lower TDM program, not the TDM plus is uh, very achievable. It's only a 12% reduction in single occupancy vehicles from a baseline or completely suburban model. The city of Golden is already achieving in excess of 12% mode split reduction without formalized TDM. So just based on context, land use density and the availability of some transit options um, that's already well within the achievable range okay i think we're, we're closing in here on the uh the the, the final cutoff of 715. uh stephanie if you could let me share uh my uh screen again i just want to put up some information before we part uh, Okay, again, um, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. This, uh, um, I hope this was educational and you, and you got most, uh, most questions answered, but there will be lots of opportunities for more engagement to come. Um, if you have written comments uh, that you want to make sure are part of the record, please email planning commission at cityofgolden.net. That's the best way to get your comments uh, to the city and to the decision makers here. Um, and all the meeting info that we've discussed in the past uh, slides are, are it's all on guidinggolden.com. So please go to guidinggolden.com. 
uh, to find those dates and times for the upcoming meetings. I know we have uh, another uh, big in-person meeting next week on Wednesday night. We also have two office hours sessions set up for next week. Uh, so so please, uh, please attend those if you can. Um, and again, if you need to contact uh, me, my, my email address is there, rmurabi at cityofgolden.net. Um, but uh, I, we thank you for attending uh, and appreciate uh, your interest in this in this topic. And we will we'll we'll make ourselves available uh, throughout the month of March. Uh, Dan, did you have some question? Another comment? Uh, I just wanted to encourage people to uh, attend those additional sessions. Also, uh, if you feel like uh, you'd like to have a meeting directly with us, you have questions or issues, you can email uh, Kim Mangle, who spoke up at. Kim at Mangle, M-A-N-G-L-E, consulting.com. And um, we'll, we'll make that effort. Also, we're working in the next uh, couple of days to start uploading videos of some of the presentation materials that are not exactly what you saw this evening, but uh, are, are cover uh, these same issues. And those are going to be at uh, our website, coursetech9street.com. And Rick will share that link as well. Yeah, we'll post that on we'll post that link on guidinggolden.com to link out to that uh, material that Dan mentioned. Um, but uh, uh, thank you all again, and we hope to see many of you next week. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.